Okay, uh, first I would like to thank the organizers for this invitation. And it's a pleasure to be here uh, giving this talk to this community. So what I'm going to do today is tell you a little bit about a theory of probabilistic Kolmogorov complexity. Uh, so this is the plan for this uh, three tutorials. So today uh, I plan to focus mostly on the basic concepts. I want to highlight some results, tell you about a major result and some of the ideas behind this proof. So I know um, uh, all of you are already tired. I'm also tired. So uh, it's going to be like a very light. So the proofs are going to be just like at a high level, very simple arguments, OK? But please stop me if you have any questions. I would prefer to go slowly so we are all on the same page than to finish the slides. So yeah, so that's the plan for today. Uh, for tomorrow, um, after introducing these basic concepts, I want to tell you about applications to cryptography and complexity theory uh, of these notions. And then in the final lecture, um, we're going to be looking at uh, prime numbers and whether we can represent some primes in some short way efficiently. OK? So that's the plan for the week. Uh, how many of you know Komogorov complexity? Could you please raise your hands? OK, most of you. How many of you have heard about time-bounded Komogorov complexity? OK, not so many. But you cannot prove anything. <laughs> What about, uh, let's see, <laughs> what about the probabilistic time-bounded Komogorov complexity? Just a priori probability, you mean? We'll see what I mean, yeah. Okay, so that means the talk is going to be useful to most of you, so that's great. All right, so br uh, brief review. So Komogorov complexity, we have some sequence of bits, a finite sequence. And uh, informally, uh, the complex, the Komogorov complexity of the sequence is the length of the shortest program that outputs the sequence. That's standard definition. Uh, so here, uh, more formal uh, uh, definition. So we fix a universal Turing machine U, and we define the Komogorov complex of a string X with respect to U as the minimum uh, length of a string, such that if we fit this string to U, then it outputs X. But intuitively, this M is some program, a description of a program uh, that outputs X. And uh, for uh, the rest of the week, we're going to fix some really nice universal Turing machine that is not worse than any other machine by much and that runs efficiently. <laughs> and like in Komogorov complexity, uh, we can do this in a very robust and reasonable way. Okay, so there's a fixed universal machine and uh, we won't be discussing this machine. So for the experts, everything I'm going to say won't depend on like prefix-free complexity or not being prefix-free. Everything will still hold uh, regardless of the machine, okay? Everything is going to be approximate up to like some log n uh, factors and so on. So, all right. So, um, and I'll abuse notation and I'll refer to M directly in many occasions, okay? So, this is an informal way of saying here's a short program that prints this, the, uh, the string, but there's always like a fixed universal machine behind in the definition. Okay, so that's Komogorov complex, it's great, but unfortunately, uh, it's uncomputable. So sometimes it's not that helpful in applications in algorithms and complexity, where we care about the running time of algorithms. So for that, we can introduce some time-bounded notions of Komogorov complexity. And uh, one of the uh, most influential definitions was suggested by Levin where you define the, uh, the uh, k little t complex of a string x. Now you take into account also the running time of the program. Okay, so now you minimize over description lens, but also over the time bounds that the machine takes. And uh, you wait in the following way, you take the length of the description plus log of the running time. And you minimize over descriptions and running time simultaneously. So you want to minimize this length of m plus log t. Okay, so just so we keep track of the different definitions, so let me just uh, write it here. So k little t of x is going to be uh, the minimum over descriptions length of the description plus log t. And uh, if we run the universal machine for t steps with this m, then we recover x. Okay? 
And uh, one of the reasons this definition, although it might look mysterious, why you would take log t instead of something else. So this definition leads to a key connection to this uh, universal algorithms introduced by Levin, okay? Where you can have an optimal algorithm up to constant uh, factors for any search problem where you can verify solutions. So it's closely related to this notion of k little t. It's one of the reasons why you define it in this way. So any questions about this definition or uh, anything I've said so far? And the universal machine yeah. is time efficient and, and that so this log t is, t is defined up to a multiplicative constant and log t is up to additive constant, so it's also balanced. Yes, yes. So you can pick a machine that is time efficient, so the overhead with respect to any other machine is going to be, say, at most like some polylog factors in the running time. Any other questions, comments? Okay, so that's uh, uh, Levin's definition. So now let me introduce another definition. So sometimes you, you want to fix the time so you're like certain that the machine is going to run just for like at most some uh, number of steps. And that's this uh, other very natural definition called uh, K uh, superscript T complexity. Now here we minimize over descriptions, but we always force the time to be at most T, okay? Sometimes T is going to be a function of the input, and I, and I wrote here T of the length of the input. Uh, but that's the main difference between the two definitions. So in this one, Okay, so these are, I would say, the two most basic notions of time-bounded Kolmogorov complexity. And uh, like time-bounded Kolmogorov complexity has been investigated for several decades. It has like many applications and algorithms and complexity. But it's still, there are some very, very basic questions uh, that remain long-standing open problems about time-bounded Kolmogorov complexity, okay? So for instance, one of them is the following. So I give you as input some string x, and I ask you what is the k little t complexity of x. So can you detect patterns in the input and tell me if there's a short program that runs in not, not too many steps and prints x. So that's a very fundamental question, and in particular, if we could do this efficiently, one can show that you can break our existing cryptography. Okay, so that's a problem that we believe to be infeasible that we cannot detect the minimum program for, for a grieving stream and this time bounded setting. But that remains open for like more than 50 years. Um, so we can also look at the most central results in Kolmogorov complexity and ask, do they survive in the time bounded setting? And here again, pretty much all the basic questions remain open. Okay. Question. Yes, question? Oh, uh, that I will run the machine for t steps. It's minimum over m and t. Oh yeah, uh, sorry, yeah, so here's m and t, right. Thanks. So minimize over descriptions and time bounds. Yeah. More questions? Okay, so for instance, for the second bullet here, we have like many of the central results like coding theorem, symmetry of information, language compression. Can we establish them in the time bounded setting? And this is also open. And finally, if you look at like natural objects we care about, let's say prime numbers, do we have prime numbers that have short and efficient description? And this also remains pretty much open. Okay, so like the basic questions, they're still there after like 50 years or so, okay? So you say in yeah. the third one, do yeah. there exist symbols? Yeah, are, are there prime numbers, like an infinite sequence of them that I can easily describe? And we don't have a good answer yet to this question. Uh, maybe a the question is, of course, not specify what do you, you mean by infinite, e easily. Yeah, so it will depend on the notion and how large is the description, of course. I'll, I'll tell you more about this, yeah. Okay, so uh, these are basic questions, they are still open. So what I wanna tell you this week is how um, in a more recent theory of probabilistic Kolmogorov complexity, we can uh, get some new insights about these old questions, okay? So that's uh, one of the goals. Okay, so here's the overview for this lecture. I'll introduce uh, probabilistic variants of these definitions, 
And then we will compare these new uh, definitions with the previous ones. And I will tell you about some uh, striking applications of these notions to complexity theory. At least give you an overview of some results. All right, so let's start off with uh, some basic definitions here. So we want to introduce the notion of probability and uh, randomized computations to these descriptions. And uh, these definitions are gonna be inspired by something called pseudo-deterministic algorithms that have been investigated over the last 10 years or so. So a pseudo-deterministic algorithm is a randomized procedure, but it outputs a canonical string with high probability. Okay, so it makes random choices, but most likely it will produce the same answer. And uh, if we translate that to Kolmogorov complexity, uh, what we're gonna have is a notion of probabilistic decompression. Okay, so now we're gonna have a, a representation for your sequence or for your string. But we're gonna recover your string from the representation with high probability using a randomized computation. Okay, so we still represent strings deterministically, so there's like a description, a finite and like a deterministic description M, but the way you recover the string from M is probabilistic, okay? So, um, uh, so let's uh, first uh, introduce a randomized notion of uh, Levin's complexity. So uh, that's just the original definition. And now, uh, the randomized analog is uh, the natural definition we would expect so now, instead of minimizing over uh, deterministic programs, we're gonna minimize over randomized programs that generate this string with high probability. Okay, so I, uh, I'll just keep the definition here. It's uh, written there. Again, we minimize over descriptions and over time bounds. But now the decompression is probabilistic. So we're looking at descriptions such that the universal machine, given the description and the randomness, generate x with probably at least two thirds. Okay. So if this value is k, then I have a program and a time bound such that the sum of these two quantities is k. And with decent probability, I can recover my string using the description. Okay, so that's a randomized KDOT. Yes? Is it at all plausible that the two are roughly the same? Yeah, I'm going to discuss this soon. Yeah. More questions? Is it trivial upper bounds on RKT? Um, Just repeat the question. Okay, the question is is that a trivial upper bound on RK little t? Um, yes, you could just use a, say, a deterministic program, and that is very efficient. It just encodes the string, and then it will be like uh, close to n. Oh, if you want to compute RKT of a string, uh, yeah, that's a very good question. Can you compute RKT if I give you a string? And uh, what you could do is you could uh, try all possible randomized programs and estimate the probability that the program generates x. And if that probability is large, then you have a witness, uh, an upper bound on RKT complexity. Now, provided that you don't care about being uh, exacting the computation of that probability to thirds, you can do this searching exponential time in two to the n. But if, you want but if you want to estimate that they probably exactly, then it might take much more than exponential time. Because the randomness complexity of the machine could be exponential, so you have another uh, exponential. Yeah, but even a basic, more yeah. basic question. Is there any case when under some assumption the randomized complexity is smaller than? Yeah, we're gonna go back to this question. Whether we can, like if we use randomness, can we have better compression, more, more efficient compression? And this is like an, uh, uh, an amazing possibility that could even have like practical applications, right? Like just now use on your computer, everything that you compress, you do it in a probabilistic way. Can you save space by doing that? And I'm gonna get back to this question. Yes. Okay, so now I want to highlight two uh, open problems from the deterministic classical theory that we are able to solve when we switch to the probabilistic theory. And the first one is 
uh, about the difficulty of estimating complexity. Okay, so now here's a, a, a computational question. I give you a string x and I ask you, can you tell me if the rk little t complexity of x is at most n to the epsilon or is it very close to n? Okay, so this is easier than computing it exactly. I just want you to distinguish sort of like the structure case from the random case. Okay, and this remains open for, the, uh, for Levin's complexity. Uh, but five years ago, uh, uh, I noticed that for this uh, uh, notion, you can actually show an unconditional lower bound. Okay, so here's the theorem. Uh, there's no randomized algorithm running in quasi-polynomial time that is able to separate these two sets of strings. Okay, so this is a provably hard computational problem, even if you use randomness and you can run in quasi-polynomial time. Um, any questions about this statement? Okay, so uh, and to me, uh, five years ago, uh, this was one of the reasons why I, I thought that there would be like very interesting things we might be able to say when we switch to the randomized world. And since then I have been investigating these notions. But this was like the very first result that uh, focused my attention on this theory. So now I want to mention uh, uh, another result. Uh, but for that, I need to introduce uh, randomized notions uh, for K superscript T. Uh, so that's the original definition. And the uh, randomized definition is, uh, is very natural. So the only difference is that, again, we'll be looking at randomized programs. Okay, so we minimize of the descriptions that generate x with probably at least two thirds, and the time bound is fixed to t, where t is a parameter here in the definition. Questions so far? Yes? So, first of all, here, so the t in the two contexts is different because now we are talking about a computable function and there is a natural number. Yes, so here you minimize over all t's in this definition. Here you fix a t, and that gives you a notion of complexity, and you minimize over descriptions. I mean, the, 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 how do you, I mean, formalize um, a randomized program in this in this sense of the universal machine? I mean, the, now now yeah. the machine has access to like a finite toggle that you right that you um, sample at random, mm -hmm. and then this is the probability of. Uh, accepting with that oracle. Yeah, so the question is how do you formalize the randomized computation in this notion? And what is in the uh, screen here is the informal definition. It's a randomized program M. Here's a formal definition. So we know we'll be running for T steps. So we give a random string of length T to the universal machine. And then we estimate this probability. If it's two thirds, then that's a correct, a good program. More questions? All right, let's move on. Okay, so now getting back to a question that was asked before. So we would like to understand, like, can we have shorter uh, uh, representations using uh, this probabilistic theory? And getting back to this uh, question about primes, so it's a node result that for every large enough n, there's some n-bit prime that has k little t complexity roughly n over two. And it's been a long-standing open problem to show the existence of primes with shorter descriptions, okay? That beat n over two for Levin's complexity. Um, this is closely related to the problem of explicit generation of primes because of this equivalence between k little t and universal search. So this was like one of the polymath projects like 10, 10 plus years ago. Can we find faster algorithms that generate large primes? But this remains the state of the art for deterministic computations. So what we proved uh, a few years back is that 
if we look at the randomized notions, then indeed we can have better descriptions. And in particular, for every epsilon, we can find large primes where the arcade complexity of the prime is at most n to the epsilon. Okay, so it's sub-polynomial complexity now for at least some infinite sequence of primes. Um, now there's something uh, that's not very appealing about this bound, which is that for r k little t and for k little t, your running time can be exponential in the complexity, right? That's part of the definition. You only know that the description plus log of the running time is at most n to the epsilon. So as far as we know, this is a short representation, but to recover the prime from the representation could take you exponential time. And that's the distinction between r k little t and our k uh, superscript t, where we have like a fixed time bound. So two years later, what we proved is that you can indeed get a better guarantee, uh, and you can get primes where the rk poly complex is at most n to the epsilon. <coughs> okay, so now we can recover the prime efficiently as well, in addition to compressing it to n to the epsilon bits. And what I would like to do on Thursday is to show a very recent result where we improved this bound to log n so that we can represent primes with just log n bits, okay? And that's gonna be the goal for t Thursday uh, lecture. So any questions so far? Th these were just two results that I wanted to highlight showing like how this probabilistic theory can lead to some insights about the classical questions. Yeah? Uh, how rare are those sense? Uh, can you repeat? Uh, okay, so you claim that for infinitely many, mm -hmm. uh, yes. do they form arithmetic progression or what? The, you mean the different ends? Yes. No, we have no control over the ends. So this is just an existential result saying for infinitely many ends, we can find Maybe some. They are very rare, something like uh, the, the proof gives uh, an exponential upper bound on the distance, but I would say that's not a good bound, yeah. And it's a very interesting question whether you can do it for every end, and that's open, yeah. But for example, if yeah. somebody explains why the number two to the n plus, I don't know, 47 mm -hmm. is prime for infinitely many n, yeah. then it will follow. Then it will be a, a, an easy proof of this result, yeah. yeah. Right. So and this is not known. Whether such yeah, for instance, we, we have these uh, Mersenne primes, right, which are of the form 2 to the p minus 1. So these are just sequence of ones. So if we had infinitely many Mersenne primes, this would trivialize all these results. So the point is to get something unconditional uh, about primes. Yeah. All right, I think I'm gonna move on so I can cover uh, more results. Yeah. Is this that the second result implies the first? Yes, it does. Oh, if the second result implies the first, is that okay? Uh, yes, because the running time is poly, so you, yeah. Yeah, it's a stronger result, thanks. Okay, so uh, fine, uh, last definition. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated, but uh, I claim it's also natural. Uh, so, I'll call PKT the probabilistic t-time bounded Komogorov complexity uh, of a string uh, as the following quantity. So we're gonna switch the quantifiers. Instead of having a single program that generates x with high probability, the definition says that for most random strings, I can pick a program that depends on the random string, and uh, now this program, given the random string, outputs x. Okay, so. So it's the minimum k such that um, the probability that exists a program of small length such that this program generates x uh, given the randomness, uh, this probability is at least two thirds. Okay. So it's the minimum k such that for most choices of the randomness, I have a short program such that uh, the universal machine given this program and given r outputs x with probability two thirds. Does that just mean that k t of x given r is, is, is at most k, right? Just the, the 
Can you repeat? The, mm -hmm. that the, what's inside the probability? Yes. Uh, and there it just means that kt of x given r is at most k. Okay, so we switch the quantifiers. The previous definition had a single program generating x with high probability. Well, for most choices of the randomness, depending on the randomness, I have a short program for generating x. Okay, so um, let's now compare these definitions with the deterministic definitions. Uh, and to do that, here's a, it's like a communication complex scenario which will allow us to get more intuition about the definitions, okay? So we have two players, Merlin, which is computationally unbounded, and Arthur, who is computationally bounded. And Merlin has a string X, and Merlin, Merlin would like to send this string to Arthur. Okay, and they want to minimize communication. It's a single round protocol, so Merlin sends a single message to Arthur. So let's say uh, what happens in the case where the string X has small uh, time-bounded Kolmogorov complexity in the deterministic case. So uh, in that case, uh, Merlin can just send a program, uh, and this program runs in at most T steps, and then R2 can recover the string with complexity T, okay? So that's the first scenario. Uh, R2 can deterministically recover the string from the program. And this feels like NP, right? That there exists a short program, and then you just send it over. Now, in the case of RK, now there is a randomized program, and Merlin can send the randomized program. And now Arthur can use its uh, uh, private randomness to recover X from M with high probability. Okay, so that's the second case. Finally, in the case of PKT, uh, remember, for most choices of the random string, there is a short program. So you can think of then as sharing some uh, random string, so there's a public random string. And now the definition says for most choices of the public random string, there's some short description. And if Merlin sends the short description, Arthur can just use the description and the public randomness to recover X. Okay, so uh, that's the analogy uh, for the three definitions with protocols. And if you're familiar with complexity theory, this looks more like AM protocols. All right. Public randomness. With, yeah, there, there is public randomness, yes. All right, so, um, and similarly to the complexity classes, uh, it's not hard to show that you have these inequalities between these different uh, notions of complexity. Uh, you can only decrease when you move from K to RK and from RK to PK. And you can also prove that time unbounded Kolmogorov complexity is uh, not much larger than PK little t, uh, PKT. Okay, uh, now Valentin was telling us about de-randomization. And if you make very strong assumptions from complexity theory that can give you different kinds of PRGs, it turns out that you can show that all these notions, they actually coincide uh, up to some small approximating factor, okay? So for instance, uh, if you assume that uh, E contains uh, problems that are hard for non-deterministic circuits of exponential size, that's the second row, then you can remove all the randomness from PK and get a deterministic description, okay? So the length in, uh, increase a little bit by log the running time might have a poly time overhead, but these, all these notions will be close to each other. Okay, so under strong assumptions, randomness won't buy as much in terms of like compressing strings. So I uh, hope that answers one of the questions asked before. So if you believe in these very strong hardness assumptions, the notions essentially coincide. But I would say that the main advantage of this probabilistic theory um, is that, of course, if you believe on, on those hardness assumptions, then all the results you prove for PK and RK, they, uh, you can transfer them to the deterministic setting, answering these open problems that I showed in the beginning of the talk. But if those assumptions are false, the 
probabilistic theory still allows us to uh, develop an unconditional theory, okay? That might still be interesting. All right, any additional questions? Okay, so now with the remaining time that I have, I'll try to show you uh, an application to the study of average case complexity. Um, if you have questions, please interrupt me because uh, there'll be like some uh, sketches of some proofs now. Okay, so um, average case complexity. Uh, so that's uh, also a, a theory that was investigated uh, since the 70s. Uh, now, you look at a computational problem, but you also have a distribution over the inputs. So we have a pair, uh, a, a language and a distribution. And uh, we say that the problem is solvable in average case polynomial time with respect to the distribution. If there is an algorithm A such that the following holds, so you tell the algorithm, I want a very good approximation to the solution, I want to be correct on most inputs, so you give a parameter K. And now, the probability over the distribution D that this algorithm is incorrect is the most one over K. So you, you have some uh, scheme that allows you to get better and better uh, approximations for the language. And second, uh, we're gonna assume that this algorithm never makes a mistake, okay? So for every X in the support, it either gives a correct answer and, or it says, I don't know. Okay, so that's one of the definitions of average case complexity. And in the case when the pair L and D admits an efficient A like this, we say that the pair is in this class uh, average P. Okay, so that's a classical definition. And we can also consider a randomized analog called average BPP, but this won't be so important for this talk, okay? All right, so um, now let's ask the following question. Uh, if we have a problem such that on any polynomial time sample distribution, the problem is easy on average, can we say something about worst case complexity? Okay, because what we really want to achieve in the best case is like worst case algorithms, right? That work on our inputs. But what if you only have an algorithm for every sampleable distribution? So in some sense, like, we can't find hard instances. Whenever I produce a sampleable distribution, there's a good algorithm for that distribution. Is there anything we can say about the worst case complexity? And it feels to me like an intriguing uh, question, right? So maybe it's not related. Uh, but it turns out that uh, using a time-bounded Kolmogorov complexity, you can establish a very interesting link between these two notions. Okay. So here's a theorem uh, proved by Antunes and Ford now. Under a very strong assumption, they showed the following. If you have a language such that this language is e easy on every polytime sampleable distribution, then this is equivalent to, for every t, we having a, an algorithm that solves this language in the worst case, and the running time is controlled by two to the kt of x minus k of x, essentially. Okay, so this quantity in the exponent is called the uh, computational depth of the string. So it's the time-bounded Kolmogorov complexity with respect to time-bound t minus the time-unbounded Kolmogorov complexity. So you're looking at the gap between these two notions. I'm sorry, could you remind us what p-sampling means? Yeah, so a distribution uh, is p-sampable if there is an efficient procedure that given a truly uniform string uh, produces a sample from the distribution. And this process generates a distribution that is statistically the same as the original distribution. So you can sample from the distribution using <coughs> uniformly random uh, bits. So that is an efficient process that generates the distribution. Polynomial analysis is that from a uniform distribution, yes. you give it a uniform distribution input, and yes. something exactly. that thing will be the true. Yeah, the distribution. <coughs> yeah. Okay, so this gives a characterization that it can solve something over all distributions efficiently, or sampleable distributions, if and only if there is an algorithm whose worst case running time is exponential in the computational depth. Okay, so it's a very interesting link. And they prove this under a strong assumption uh, that there's a language in E that doesn't have sub-exponential size circuits 
with certain oracle gates in the polynomial hierarchy. Uh, and something we can do uh, now that we have this probabilistic fear of Kumogorov complexity is to establish an unconditional version. Okay, so we prove that you have the same equivalence except that now in the exponent you have the notion of probabilistic computational depth. So it's PK minus K. And there's no need to make an assumption. Okay, so I, I wanna tell you a little bit about the proof of this theorem. And uh, a very useful ingredient in this proof is instead of considering all polytime sampleable distributions, we're gonna be looking at a single distribution with very nice properties. And this is called uh, roughly the universal time bounded distribution. Uh, so informally, this is a distribution where we assign to every n bit string x two to the minus pkt of x. Just before yeah. this. Yes. So it, it seems that your your result is stronger. Yes. If if you go from 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 uh, it, th th this this time is smaller. Yes. Yeah, that's a very good point. So pk could be uh, less than kt. So pkt can be less than kt. So in in that sense, yes, it seems like it would have a smaller running time. But if you think about their theorem, which gets kt, it makes a very strong assumption. And under that assumption, pk and kt, they actually collapse. So you can de-randomize pk and get a deterministic description. No, but so, in, yeah. in this theorem, if we want to go from, 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 from top to bottom, yes, yes. this, this Antunes Fortnow theorem is highly non-trivial. Um, or, 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 or the different direction, what is non-trivial? There, there's one direction that is maybe, I think both directions are interesting. I'm gonna show you one of the directions, yeah. But we're, you're right, so you get like a, a better bound if you, uh, that's all the information you have, yes. No assumption for every language AL, there is an equivalence between these two assumptions, yes. So I guess if, <coughs> if you go back under that assumption, you can state the theorem with PKT and it will not change anything. Yeah, that's true. Under that assumption, PKT and KT, they are the same. If you want to think of it in this way, yes. Uh, excuse me, uh, uh, are you going to, to uh, say something about the proof of, of the theorem on, on, on the next slide? Yes, I will say something about okay. the proof, yes, thank you. Okay, so one of the things you're doing the proof is, instead of talking about all polytime sampleable distributions, you can focus on a single distribution that has nice properties, and you define it in this way, roughly, so the weight of x under this mu is two to the minus pkt of x. Okay, so this is an analogy to what happens in time bounded Kolmogorov complexity. It's a time bounded version of the uh, universal distribution. And this is sampleable? Uh, you can uh, sample a distribution that dominates this distribution, yes. Thank you. Okay, so, uh, and the link between the all polytime sampleable distributions and this distribution is obtained by something called a coding theorem. So let me tell you about this coding theorem now. Okay, so the coding theorem in Kolmogorov complexity is a result saying that if I can sample an object by some effective process and it generates the object with probability delta, then, the, then there's a short description of the object. So it's Kolmogorov complexity is roughly log one over delta. And what we would like to have is an efficient version now in the probabilistic theory of Kolmogorov complexity. And, um, this is uh, a result we observed with uh, Marius, who is here, and uh, Zheng Jia. So we can have a polytime version which says the following. So if now D is a polytime sampleable distribution, then for every string X, you can find a PK poly description of X whose complexity is of order log one over the weight of X under the distribution. Okay, so this is an analog of the time unbounded theorem for PKT complexity. It's an unconditional result. Okay, questions about this statement. So from efficiently sampling an object with probability delta, it's PKT complexities at most log one over delta. Yeah. 
Okay, and that's unconditional. So it's sort of like taking some of the major results from Komogorov complexity and establishing unconditional versions now in the time-bounded setting, thanks to the use of randomness. No, so it's somehow yeah. you want to establish the connection between this complexity and logarithm of a priori probability. Yes. But for, is, it, is it important that you have some specific distribution? Or there exists something like a universal distribution which gives universal uh, a priori probability with polynomial time bound? So in this uh, result, it works for any sampleable distribution, but it turns out that this is essentially like if you can do for the time bounded universal distribution. So there exists something like time, time bounded Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Okay, now I might be a little bit short on time, so I could sketch the proof of this result where you understand exactly why you want PKT to be defined in this way, or I can tell you more about the proof of this equivalence. Um, I guess like, because we're talking about this probabilistic notions, it might be worth seeing like why they are useful. So maybe I'll tell you about the proof of the coding theorem, okay? All right, so, this is what we want to do. So we have a polytime sampler. So it takes a uniform random string and uh, it generates some x with probability delta. And now we want to show that the PKT complex of x is at most log one over delta, where t is some polynomial running time. And remember, definition of PKT says the following. For most choices of the random string, there exists a <laughs> short description of x given the random string. Okay, so that's our goal. So let's look at the random string that is input to the sampler. So there's some m bit string, and uh, we call it r. So the sampler takes r and generates some object, and it generates x with probability delta. And this is the fraction of input seeds that generate x, okay? If you run the sampler with the seeds. And we know that there's at least a delta fraction of seeds with this property. So now let's consider a completely random hash function, okay? That is trying to hit this region here, this good set of m-bit strings. So we're gonna take a completely random hash function mapping k bits to m-bits and we're gonna get back to k later. But right now, the output length is m, so we're trying to hit that region over there. Okay, and notice the following. Because this h is completely random, so we were essentially taking two to the k random points, right? So we take two to the k random points, and what's the probability that none of these points will be in the good region, okay? So this probability will be at most one minus delta raised to t to the k, right? And if we take k to be large enough to be roughly log one over delta, then this probability is a small constant, okay? So that means the following. For most choices of this random hash function, I can get a short description of x given uh, the rash function. And this short description is just the seed, which is k bits, that I need, that will lead to x. Okay, so that's why this order of quantifiers is interesting. For most choices of the random hash function, I can pick a short description and I can recover x. Okay, and that's exactly PKT complexity. Any questions about this argument? So how, how many bits for x? Yeah, I, I, that's a very good point. So that's an issue. How many bits you need to generate H? And we're going to get back to this. Your question? Oh, okay. Good. Yeah, so this proof is almost complete, except that there's an issue. So this H can be of exponential size, right? It's truly random. So if, let's say, log 1 over delta is like n to the epsilon, then this H might have a description of exponential uh, length in, in, in log one of delta, okay, so. But it turns out that you can fix this proof using some ideas from the randomization. That you don't need to pick a completely random H in this argument, okay. So that's a more succinct H that you can describe with just poly n bits. And that's part of the randomness here in the definition of PK. 
they use some expanders or, or so there are different ways of proving this theorem. One uh, proof uses the PRG against AC0 circuits. That is unconditional, and that's enough to randomize this proof. But there are other proofs as well. <coughs> Any additional questions? So in a this <coughs> log n factor that is the, 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 the complexity of the, of the ash? Um, so the... The seed is what takes you log one over delta in this argument. And log n uh, is like, uh, let's say I'm using the sampler on n-bit strings. And so maybe like there's some, you have to pay something to encode n, but you can like take care of all the costs depending on the settings. So maybe you won't need to pay this n, so log n. So. Question, it seems to me that in the proof of Antunes and Fortno, there was a very funny pseudo-random generator kind of uh, composition of two versions of Nissan Wigderson. So, what is the catch? Why you cannot adapt this argument to the settings? Right. So, the, uh, the difference, the key difference between this proof and the original proof is that we're not paying for the length of this random string. So, provided that, that that's, this random string is like poly n random bits, then we'll be fine because we only uh, want to have a description of complexity poly n in the randomness and in the running time. And in the Antunes for now, they're also minimizing the seed length for this R because you want a deterministic description. No, but, but see, yeah. you, it seems that you go from, from in, in this theorem from, from top to bottom, yeah? Mm -hmm. In what sense? So there was a theorem that something is equivalent. This, there are two directions. Yes, yes. So now this is for, for which part? Yeah, yeah. From yeah, top to bottom. Yeah, so. let, let me get back to this. Okay, so. The coding theorem is used to connect the first two sentences. The uh, easiness with respect to polytime sampleable distributions is the same thing as easiness with respect to the uh, universal distribution. And that is where you use the coding theorem. So, uh, so uh, here's a concept from uh, average case complexity. We say that a distribution D1 dominates the distribution D2 if the following holds. Okay, so D1 dominates D2 if the weight of X under D1 is not much less than the weight of X under D2, okay? And if you think about average case complexity, you're trying to minimize the error region of an algorithm, right? And if you, the two distributions are related for every point, then you know, if one makes a small number of mistakes with respect to one distribution, then you get the same for the other distribution. So you wanna show that the distributions are the same up to domination. And uh, that gives you the equivalence between one and two. And now, uh, the, way, the way you apply this theorem is, you take any D2 that is a sampleable distribution, so this is like P sampleable. And now you fix any X such that the weight of, of X under D2 is delta, okay? Now if you apply the coding theorem, so this is a sampleable distribution, so you get that the PK complexity of X is at most log one over delta. And now if you go back to the definition of that distribution, so you get two to the minus PK of X, which is like delta again. So that shows that the weight over X now under D2 is also at least delta, maybe with some loss. Okay, and that's established the domination property that you need. But still a yeah. simple question. This coding the theorem, if yeah. you just look at, at, at the York theorem, it's needed for the going down or, or up or in both directions? To go down, so... Um, or to go up. Oh, sorry, to go... Um, okay, so that's, uh, that's the relation. Now, what you can show is that if you are easy uh, with respect to D1, and D1 dominates D2, then you, the problem is easy on the D2, uh, and the D2, okay? 
So yeah, now let's just apply this and see what happens. Up. Where are going up? Uh, so we are going up. Yeah, so we're going up, right? Yes. And so because your statement is stronger, it's not not that uh, surprising mm -hmm. that the proof can be doesn't need complicated expanders about which Andreas. All right, fine. But how how you go? Yeah, down? now you go down. You just say that this distribution is a, is essentially sampleable, and that first bullet is like for every sampleable, it's easy, and then you get the equivalence. So. Yeah, so you can show that this distribution is dominated by a sampleable distribution. So it, it's like a kind of a particular case of the first for all quantifier. It's like for all p sampleable distribution. Okay, so that established equivalence between the first two uh, uh, items. And then the relation between the universal distribution in the time bounded setting and worst case complexity. So that's an analogy. Uh, it's an analog result for something that holds in time unbounded Kolmogorov complexity. Okay, there, if you have the a universal distribution and it's easy on average, then it's easy in the worst case. This is sort of like a time bounded version of that equivalence. <coughs> All right, so that, uh, that's the sketch. Um, yeah, I, I have one final application of these ideas, but uh, I guess I'm short on time. So what's the, no, 10, minutes. 10 minutes? Thank you. Okay, so um, now let's look uh, again at the relation between worst case complexity and average case complexity. And um, one of the uh, longstanding problems in complexity is the following. Uh, are problems in NP easy on average? Is it the case that every language in NP and for every polynomial time sampleable distribution, I can solve this NP problem uh, fast in polynomial time on average? So, okay, formally, is this NP the class of such problems containing average P? Uh, and this, I would say, is as interesting as, as the P versus NP problem because it's even closer to practice, right? So, you want to understand can we solve problems, hard problems in uh, NP? on average in polynomial time. So this might be as relevant as like worst case in, in some applications. So it's also a very interesting question. Uh, but again, it's we're very far from resolving it. And uh, an easier problem you might uh, inquire about is the following. Can we link worst case complexity uh, of NP and its average case complexity? Okay, uh, in particular, if we show P is different from NP, can we also conclude that NP is hard on average? So this is called a worst case to average case reduction. And uh, this is what was known until very recently. Um, so looking at the question in the contrapositive, so what you would like to understand is, is the following. So if every distributional problem in NP is easy on average, uh, is NP easy in the worst case, okay? Can I get a worst case algorithm? And in 92, uh, it was noted that if NP is easy on average, then actually you can solve every problem in NP in the worst case in time two to the n. And this might look trivial at first, but it's actually a non-trivial bound. And the reason being the trivial algorithm for NP searches over the witness space, which might have size like n square, n cube, and so on. But here you get a two to the n upper bound. Okay, so you're doing something non-trivial here. And it was uh, open for a long time to improve this upper bound of two to the n. Okay, and in particular, even if you assume that every problem in the polynomial hierarchy was easy on average, it wasn't known how to show that you can solve NP faster than two to the n time in the worst case. So this was open until a few years ago, where Shuichi. Uh, Yes. Yes. So it was open before the before the result, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm saying like after this result, that there has been no improvement until three years ago, that we could only do like two to the n in the upper bound. We couldn't beat this two to the n. That is big O and small. Yeah, small. that is a little O there. Ah, Sorry. Yes. Oh. <laughs> okay, and then. Uh, three years ago, uh, Shuichi Hirahara proved uh, an improvement, and he showed that 
let's say if you look at the uh, final box over there, so if every problem in pH is this on average, then you can actually solve NP and actually every problem in pH in time two to the n over log n. Okay, so that's an improvement over the two to the n bound. And uh, yeah, so we, we were stuck for a long time on how to do better. And, uh, and what I find very striking about this proof is the only known proof of this result goes through Komogorov complexity. Okay, so the statements, they have nothing to do with Komogorov complexity. They are about average case and worst case complexity. And right now, that's the only proof we have. It goes through time-bounded Komogorov complexity. And this, is, I think, is very interesting. So a year later, uh, with Valentin, uh, Haley, and Jinja, we extended these results to the randomized setting, which is more robust in average case complexity. And we also simplified the proof a little bit. And now, so we have analog results in the randomized case, okay? Things are easy with randomness on average, then we can do slightly better in the worst case uh, using randomness. Uh, so the final thing I wanna tell you about, maybe in like two or three minutes, is a sketch of this uh, theorem. So how do we get a worst case upper bound from an average case using this assumption? And I should warn you that the sketch here is not, not actually giving you this result, it gives you something slightly weaker. But it will give you like many interesting ideas. Okay, so let's look back at the equivalence we established before. If something is easy on average uh, for all polytime sampleable distributions, then we can get a handle on its worst case complexity, right? It's pk minus k. So we care about this quantity for every x, what is pkt minus k of x? Now, unfortunately, uh, there can be a very large gap between these two notions, and uh, I'll leave as an exercise to show that this can be very close to n. Okay, so that's not the way to proceed, so we need to do something else. But that theorem works for every language, and here we only care about like NP in the conclusion, okay? So maybe we can do something better in some specific cases. Um, so if we inspect the proof, that K is coming from something called the language compression theorem for Komogorov complexity. So that's another central result. And um, it says the following, if you take a decidable sub subset of uh, the set of n-bit strings, then for every string in the set, it's Komogorov complexity is at most log of the size of the set. Okay, so there's a way to code the strings in the set in, in an optimal way by just taking the log of the size of the set. So this is from time unbounded theory. Even the new bottom, you don't need decidable. Say again? You, do, you don't need decidable just for a new Yes, bottom. yes, you can do even more than that. So maybe we can improve that equation by proving a coding theorem, not for k, but for a different measure, and maybe making that gap smaller. Okay, so that would be the goal. Because k is like the smallest measure of complexity. If we do it for like pk, for instance, we can at least have some hopes of improving the upper bound. So what we would like to do is uh, to show if A has complexity t, so now we're moving to the time-bounded setting, then it's pk poly complexity is at most log of the size of A. That would be the analog uh, statement. And uh, it turns out that you can do that, that you can prove this language compression theorem with pk, and then you will get pkt minus pk poly t for maybe a larger time bound. Okay. And the, way, uh, the reason you can prove that is because you have this very strong assumption that everything in polynomial hierarchy is easy on average. So we're gonna use that to prove language compression for an appropriate set using that proof that it can show it doesn't have like large enough complexity. So you get an improvement over the exponent now, using the assumption, the average case is in this assumption. And that's the uh, summary. So for every L in NP, for every input X, and for every polynomial T, we can decide if X is in L in time two to the PKT minus PK poly T of X. So we have now this new expression. And, a, and we want to understand now this expression, okay? And a crucial point here is that when you do this argument, you can use different values of t in the exponent. So you get that for any polynomial t, for instance, you can get that bound in the exponent, okay? t versus poly t. 
And that is what allows us to complete the, the, the proof, okay? Because now we're analyzing pk of t versus pk of t to the t. Uh, so these two quantities, they go from one to n. So if you now plot them in this line from one to n, you can consider different cases, right? So one good case will be they both at least n over two. So in that case, the difference can be at most n over two, right? And you have made progress in the exponent. So now I have, let's say, two to the n over two upper bound in the running time. Yeah, you want to do much better. So I'm just doing like one, one, one case. But I have no control over this point. So maybe the pkt is over there, but pk2 to the c is less than n over two. And now the gap is again larger than n over two. But because you can take different values of t in that equation, now if you can look at t1 equals to t to the c and a different value, t1 to the c, that can only decrease the complexity. So you're giving more time to the algorithm to generate x. And now you see again you have two points that are of distance at most n over two. Okay, so uh, the conclusion is that if you look at different time bounds t, poly t, poly poly t, then the difference in pk complexity is gonna be small for some two consecutive values of t. Okay, and you can explore this idea. And uh, here's a central lemma uh, proved by Switchy, that for every string x, there's some t that is not too large, such that this difference is at most n over log n. And that, that's what gives you this exponent in the running time of two to the n over log n that I mentioned before. Okay, okay so that's all I wanted to say. Uh, so everything I said in this talk is described in a much better way in this survey that I wrote with Jin uh two years ago. So that's the place to go if you want to learn more about these ideas, okay? Thank you. Uh, if you have a question, please uh, raise a hand and I give you a microphone. So just w what is a bit strange. So there, there is, you, you have initially the three quantities mm -hmm. and then you define the fourth quantity, uh, but you don't define it as, as, as a, in a similar way, this, this as a logarithm of a priori probability with bound t. Okay, so you talk- just you make special lemma. So when you say different quantities, uh, what are you talking about? Just, you, you take the universal probabilistic machine mm -hmm. and you compute the probability to generate x with time bound t. Yes, yes. So it's, it seems that one of your lemmas was somehow c c uh, relating this mm -hmm. quantity to one of three previous quantities. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But is it, does it, it has also some force, so you can have four quantities which known uh, ordering or it's somehow in, in between some of them, or what is known if you look at just at this quantity? Um, okay, I'm not sure that's uh, exactly your question. Uh, so that's pretty much the most general relation I can write about these quantities, those inequalities, there is, is no, that what you mean? There is no fourth quantity. Yeah, so what is the fourth quantity? Yeah. Fourth quantity is the logarithm. Fourth quantity is the minus logarithm of the probability to generate x with the universal probabilistic machine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's... And one of your lemma seems relating this quantity to one of these three. So yes. the question, natural question is maybe it's just the fourth quantity somewhere in between these or whatever. Why you don't consider it explicitly? Yeah, so, so you can define that and that this is done in some papers but up to like plus minus uh, log n additive term, it's exactly pk complexity. So the probability of generating x according to the uniform distribution with time bound t is two to the minus pk of x and uh, maybe time, if you look in this way, times uh, poly n factor. So yeah. it's just equivalent. Yeah, it's equivalent. So it's yeah. a very interesting it's a very interesting statement, I would say, because this quantity plays an important role and in, in non-bounded non, non yes. case. Right. So somehow you can say that AM is the right way to, to deal with because this complexity PK. Yeah, so exactly. So PK uh, is, we can prove it's tightly related to the probability under the time bound the universe distribution. And we can prove that. Now, if you make 
their randomization assumptions, how these two notions are yeah, also, yeah. yeah. So, but we can show it unconditionally, yes. Yeah, and then can we prove something like symmet symmetry theorem for something of them, or just prove some results? You st started with results on Kolmogorov complexity, yes. which we don't know for, for bounded, but right. maybe for, for, for your new nice bounded uh, quantities, you have some theorem. Yeah, that's a great question. Can we show symmetry of information for these notions? And this will be the topic for tomorrow's uh, lecture. Uh, and also, I think Valentin might tell us something related to it. So, yeah, short answer is we don't believe as symmetry of information holds for these three notions. But under assumptions, we can prove that it holds. And this is very useful and very interesting. But to, tomorrow, we'll see more about this. Yeah. Other questions? Okay then. So uh, then again, thank Igor again uh, for this. Thank you.